All right, like I said, the story takes place on this smiley face right here. And London is probably the only real city you guys know from England, where the Olympics were. So we're on the other side of England, right on this cove. And that's where we start our story. If you turn to part one, which is called The Old Buccaneer. There's five parts to this story, or six parts, and each part has several chapters. This is chapter one, The Old Sea Dog at the Admiral Benbow. Squire Trelawney, Dr. Livesey, and the rest of these gentlemen, having asked me to write down the whole particulars about Treasure Island, from the beginning to the end, keeping nothing back but the bearings of the island, and that only because there is still treasure not yet lifted, I take up my pen in the year of grace 1700, and go back to the time when my father kept the Admiral Benbow Inn, and the brown old seaman with the saber cut first took up his lodging under our roof. Hmm. I'm being buzzed. Buzz, 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 buzz. Mr. Peterman? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, God. Uh, maybe toward the end. Okay. Thank you. You built that. Sorry about that. Every other hour? Characters and setting. When do we find those out? In a story. Right now. In the beginning, we call it the exposition. The exposition. Wow. All right. All right. <laughs> any of our? Do we know any characters yet? Yes. Yeah, we do. We know that there's Squire Trelawney. All right, Squire Trelawney. Oh, okay. <laughs> Doctor Livesey. Doctor Livesey. And the rest of the gentlemen. And the rest of these gentlemen. All right, we've got three, at least three people, maybe a few more. All right. What else do we know? There's a sea guy, somebody from the sea, the sea doll, this, the brown old sea man. Anybody else, any other characters that were mentioned there as you were staring off into space and you heard me say words? The dad? Wait. There was a dad, okay. Yes? Um, and then there, the narrator is the character telling the story. Ah, the narrator is the character telling the story. Good. Now, what is he talking about in this first paragraph? Okay. They asked him to write down the story. They asked him to write down the story. So, what kind of literary device is this entire story? It is a... Oh, wait. Is it a free thing? Kind of. Wait, what did you say? Pasty looky It's pasty looky sure. I don't have it up there. A flashback. Thank you, Taylor. It is a flashback. You should have done like what last. Okay, I'll make up something. You should have done what the thing. But you need to notice anytime a story starts like this, I'm going to write, I'm going to tell you, they've asked me to tell you about this. It's a flashback. What is it he won't tell us? The treasures. Yes, ma'am. The ma location of the island. The location of the island. The bearings. Why would he not tell us the bearings of the island? Yes? Because they didn't find the treasure. Oh, no, no. What does it say? There's still, still, still There's still treasure, not yet. There's still booty. Lifted. What does that mean, Sydney? Uh, like the treasure's still on the island. There's still treasure on the island. And they don't want you to go get it. We'll tell you the story. But we won't tell you where the island is. Question. Is it like the island? Like, there's, is that where the treasure is? The X? Cause it says oh, you see a little map on there, right? You see a little map to the left on most of your books? Mm -hmm. That, um, there is an X on that, right? Yeah. So we know that there's an island that's called Treasure Island. We know there's people, and we know there's people that know where the gold is, but they won't tell us. Yes? Like, isn't that like a hand spike, like a stick or something? 
A hand spike is a stick. That's right. Sorry, is it a lever too? It can be used as a lever. Okay. All right. What is an Admiral Benbow in our setting? Admiral Benbow in. Yes. Is that just what the, the name of the guy's hotel? That's the name of the guy's hotel. That's right. His dad runs a hotel. It's called the Admiral Benbow Inn. They also have a sitting room and a bar inside. All right. So, and it actually says, go back to the time. Flashback. And he's talking about the brown old seaman with a saber cut. I remember him as if it were yesterday. As he came plodding to the indoor, his chest, his sea chest following behind him in a hand barrow. A tall, strong, heavy, nut brown man. His tarry pigtail falling over the shoulders of his soiled blue coat. His hands ragged and scarred with black, broken nails and the saber cut across one cheek, a dirty, livid white. I remember him looking round the cove and whistling to himself as he did so, and then breaking out in that old sea song that he sang so often afterwards. Fifteen men on a dead man's chest, yo ho ho in a bottle of rum. <laughs> in the high old tottering voice that seemed to have been turned, tuned and broken at the capstan bar. Then he wrapped the door with a bit of stick, like a hand spike that he carried. And when my father appeared, called roughly for a glass of rum. This, when it was brought to him, he drank slowly like a connoisseur, lingering on the taste, and still looking about him at the cliffs and up at our signboard. This is a handy cove, says he at length. At a pretty situated grog shop. Much company, mate. Does it mean much company, mate? Is there, is there anybody there? Is there anybody who hangs out out here? My father told him no, very little company, and the more that was the pity. Well then, said he, this is about for me. Here you, matey, he cried to the man who trundled the barrow. Bring up alongside and help up my chest. I'll stay here a bit, he continued. I'm a plain man. Rum, bacon, and eggs is what I want. And that head up there for the watch ships off. What you might call me, you might call me Captain. Oh, I see what you're at there. There. And he threw down three or four gold pieces on the threshold. You can tell me when I've worked through that, says he, looking as fierce as a commander. What were they worried about? Angry. Well, they were worried about what? Good, now don't give it away. They, he threw the money down. They're like, oh, do you have any money? I was, this, this guy just bullying us? Now here's some gold. Throws it on the ground at the threshold, which is the entrance of a door. They're down there, like, ah, tell me what I'm running off through all that. I'm like, whoa, gold, sweet. And indeed, bad as his clothes were, and coarsely as he spoke, he had none of the appearance of a man who sailed before the mast. He doesn't look like a weathered sailor but seemed like a mate or a skipper, a guy who's in charge, accustomed to be obeyed or to strike. The man who came with the barrow told us the mail had set him down the morning before at the Royal Goat George, that he had inquired what inns there were along the coast, and hearing ours well spoken of, I suppose, and described as lonely, had chosen it from the others for his place of residence, and that was all we could learn of our guests. So the guy dropped him off. It's like, hey, they dropped him off at the Royal George. He's been asking around and he likes your place for some reason. He was a very silent man by custom. All day he hung round the cove or upon the cliffs with a brass telescope. All evening he sat in the corner of the parlor next to the fire and drank rum and water very strong. Mostly he would not speak when spoken to only look up sudden and fierce and blow through his nose like a foghorn. And we and the people who came about our house soon learned to let him be. Every day when he came, about, uh, came back from his stroll, he would ask if any seafaring man had gone by along the road. At first we thought it was the want of company or the desire for friends of his own kind that made him ask this question. 
But at last we began to see he was desirous to avoid them. When a seaman put up at the Admiral Benbow, as now and then some did, making by the coast road for Bristol, he would look in at him through the curtain door before he entered the parlor. He'd kind of... Uh, and then he'd stroll back, then he'd stroll out. Uh, and he was always sure to be as silent as a mouse when any such was present. For me, at least, there was no secret about the matter, for I was, in a way, a sharer in his alarms. He had taken me aside one day and promised me a silver fourpenny on the first of every month. It's like, hey, I'll give you a penny every day if I would only keep my well eye open for the seafaring man with one leg, and let him know the moment that he appeared. Often enough, when the first of the month came round and I applied to him for my wage, hey, can I have my money? He would only blow through his nose at me and stare me down. But before the week was out, he, would sure, he was sure to think better of it, bring me my fourpenny piece, and repeat his orders to look out for the seafaring man with one leg. How that personage haunted my dreams, I need scarcely tell you. On stormy nights, when the wind shook the four corners of the house, and the surf roared along the cove and up the cliffs, I would see him in a thousand forms and with a thousand diabolical expressions. Now the leg would be cut off at the knee, now at the hip. Now he was a monstrous kind of creature who had never had but the one leg, and that in the middle of his body, and to see him leap and run pursue me over the hedge and ditch was the worst of nightmares. Like, oh, this giant leg, good thing is coming after me. And altogether I paid pretty dear for my monthly four penny piece in the shape of these abominable fancies. Fancies are like dreams or uh, yeah, probably dreams is the best way to say it. Abominable dreams. But though I was so terrified by the idea of the seafaring man with one leg, I was far less afraid of the captain himself than anybody else who knew him. There were nights when he took a deal more rum and water than his head would carry, or he got a little tipsy. And then he would sometimes sit and sing his wicked old wild sea songs, minding nobody. But sometimes he would call for glasses round and force all the trembling company to listen to his stories or bear a chorus to his singing. Often I have heard the house shaking with a no ho ho I bought our rum. All the neighbors joining in for dear life with the fear of death upon them and each singing louder than the other to avoid remark. For in these fits he was the most overriding companion ever known. He would slap his hand on the table for silence. Shut up! He would fly up in a passion of anger at a question, or sometimes because none was put. Why, how dare you question me? Then a little bit later, why aren't you asking questions? Ask me what I know. And everybody's freaked out, but a little bit entertained by this weird guy. He would fly up in a passion of anger at a question, that's where I am again, or sometimes because none was put. And so he judged the company was not following his story. Nor would he allow anyone to leave the inn till he had drunk himself sleepy and then reeled off to bed. Her sto his stories were what frightened people worst of all. Dreadful stories they were about hanging and walking the plank and storms at sea and the dry tortugas and wild deeds in places on the Spanish main. By his own account, he must have lived his life among some of the wickedest men that God ever allowed upon the sea. And the language in which he told these stories shocked our plain country people almost as much as the crimes that he described. My father was always saying the inn would be ruined, for people would soon cease coming there to be tyrannized over and put down and sent shivering to their beds. But I really believe his presence did us good. People were frightened at the time, but on looking back, they rather liked it. There was a fine excitement in a quiet country life, and there was even a party of the younger men who pretended to admire him, calling him a true seed oak and a real old salt and such like names, and saying there was the sort of man that England that made England terrible, 
Let's see. So, the town, he's, we've got a guy, he's hanging out. Tell me about him. Tell me about this guy. Yeah. Loud. He's loud. Good. Sir? He loves rum. He loves rum. Let me tell you right now, why does he drink rum? Not just because you think he's a pirate. Yeah? It's hard liquor. It is hard. Yeah? Nothing better to do. Nothing better to do. Well, here's what it is. Guys got addicted to rum because the water on the ship would get old and moldy, and you needed to use the alcohol from the rum to sterilize it. And then you pour the rum into the water to make it drinkable. It, they call it grog. And so the reason people, everybody thinks they're always drunk is because they would use the rum to sterilize it. And then people were like, wait a minute, why don't I just drink the sterilizer? This is awesome. Or they just, oh, I'm going to have a little water. I'm going to use some rum to clean it out. And eh, that's probably enough rum. Right? So they actually used the rum as a good thing, and people abused it. Uh, people like him or dislike him? Just like him. They like him, yeah. Entertaining. He's entertaining. He's kind of a cool guy to have at the bar. People, the younger guys, are like, this guy's awesome. I wouldn't want to deal with him. So it makes England great. Who's he afraid of? Sea so one naked guy, sea man. Yeah. Just one leg. A, a what? He has one. The sea man has one leg. Yeah, the seafaring man with one leg. All right. In one way, indeed, he bade fair to ruin us. And things looked good for the end, but he was going to ruin us. For he kept on staying week after week, and at last month after month, so that all the money had been long exhausted. And still my father never plucked up the heart to insist on having more. He never paid his bills. After about a month, all that gold was used up. But he'd never pay him back. If he, if he ever mentioned it, the captain blew his, through his nose <sighs> so loudly that you might say he had roared and stared my poor father out of the room. <clears throat> Don't ask me about money. I'd do the snort thing, but I'd end up with a booger on my book. Probably. There's probably something back here. I have seen him wringing his hands after such a rebuff, and I'm sure the annoyance of the terror he lived in must have greatly hastened his early and unhappy death. Who's gonna die? Foreshadowing. Dad's gonna die. Yikes. Foreshadowing, right? All the time he lived with us, the captain made no change whatever in his dress but to buy some stockings from a hawker. Yeah, you know, I sold him some socks, but otherwise he wore the same clothes every single day. One of the cocks of his hat having fallen down, that's a feather, he let it hang from that day forth, though it was a great annoyance when it blew. It was like, he's got this feather always flapping in his face. I remember the appearance of his coat when he patched himself upstairs in his room, and which before the end was nothing but patches. It's like, oh, I got a hole here. I got a hole here. Now it's just a big coat of patches put together. He never wrote or received a letter, and he never spoke with any but the neighbors, and with these, for the most part, only when drunk on rum. The great sea chest none of us had ever seen open. Uh, he was only once crossed, and that was towards the end, when my poor father was far gone in a decline that took him off. Dr. Livesey came late one afternoon to see the patient, took a bit of dinner from my mother. Wait, Dr. Livesey, who's that? The doctor right there. Yeah? No, it's good. Is that the first time he's been mentioned? No. So no? When was he mentioned before? At the very beginning. Oh! That Dr. Livesey that told him to write things down. Huh. Okay. He was once crossed, and that was towards the end, when my poor father was far gone in a decline, but took him off. Dr. Livesey came late one afternoon to see the patient. Took a bit of dinner from my mother. Who's the patient? His dad. Good. 
took a bit of dinner from my mother, and went into the parlor to smoke a pipe until his horse should come down from the hamlet, for we had no stabling at the old Benbow. I followed him in, and I remember observing the contrast, the contrast, the neat, bright doctor with his powder as white as snow. Powder? Wig. Yeah, his big white wig. I always think of George Washington with Dr. Lucy. I don't know why, but big wig and he's a giant guy and powerful and everything's elegant about him. And then you got the old sea dog in the corner. I followed him in, and I remember observing the contrast, the neat, bright doctor with his powder as white as snow, and his bright black eyes and pleasant manners, made with the cultish country folk, and above all, with that filthy, heavy, bleared scarecrow of a pirate of ours, sitting far gone in rum, with his arms on the table. It's like, wow, this guy is so different than the rest of us, but he's really different than that drunk-looking guy in the corner. Suddenly he, the captain, that is, began to pipe up his eternal song. Fifteen men or a dead man's chest. Yo, ho, ho, and a bottle of rum. Drinking a devil and done for the rest. Yo, ho, ho, and a bottle of rum. At first I had supposed the dead man's chest to be that identical big box of his upstairs in the front room. And the thought had been mingled in my nightmares with that of the one-legged seafaring man. But by this time, we had all long ceased to pay any attention, any particular notice to the song. It was new that night to nobody but Dr. Livesey, and on him I observed it did not produce an agreeable effect. So everybody else was like, ah, that's his old song, but Dr. Livesey is like, who's speaking over there about dead men's chests? He looks over, and the gardener, Wait, uh, for he looked up for a moment quite angrily before he went on with his talk to old Taylor, the gardener, on a new cure for the rheumatics. Pause, pardon me. Buzz. Maybe four more minutes. Who is it? Huh? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Bye. Okay, and she didn't tell me. Uh, he looked up for a moment, quite angrily, before he went on with his talk to old Taylor, the gardener, on a new cure for the rheumatics. In the meantime, the captain gradually brightened up at his own music, and at last flapped his hand on the table before him in a way we all know to mean silence. And everybody else knows. Shh, shut up. The voices stopped at once, all but Dr. Lucy's. Well, I believe I'm going to tell you more about this rheumatic disease and the joints and the problems. I think we can figure out a way to solve this. He went on as before, and drawing briskly at his pipe between every word or two, and the captain glared at him for a while. Flapped his hand again. Glared still harder. Silence! Silence there between the decks! Will you addressing me, sir? Says the doctor. And when the ruffian had told him, with another oath, that this was so, I have only one thing to say to you, sir, replies the doctor, that if you keep on drinking rum, the world will soon be quit of a very dirty scoundrel. The old fellow's fury was awful. He sprang to his feet, drew and opened his sailor's clasp knife, and, balancing it on, his, on the palm of his hand, threatened to pin the doctor to the wall. The doctor never so much as moved. He spoke to him as before over his shoulder, and in the same tone of voice, rather high, so that all in the room might hear, but perfectly steady and calm. There's a guy, kind of rough, scares everybody else. He's got a big knife in the doctor's neck. And the doctor says, If you do not put that knife this instant in your pocket, I promise upon my honor you shall hang at the next assizes. Then followed a battle of looks between them. 
But the captain soon knuckled under, put up his weapon, and resumed his seat, grumbling like a beaten dog. And now, sir, continued the doctor, since I know, now know there's such a fellow in my district, you may count, I'll have an eye upon you day and night. I'm not a doctor only, I'm a magistrate. And if I catch a breath of complaint against you, if it's only for a piece of incivility like tonight's, I'll take effectual means to have you hunted down and routed out of this. Let that suffice. Soon after, Dr. Livesey's horse came to the door, and he rode away. But the captain held his peace that evening, and for many more evenings to come. All right. Let's break it down. What happened in this story, in the, in the first chapter? Yep. Doctor's like, you better be quiet, boy. Alright, so the doctor's this brave, tough dude. Talks back to the to the captain. Master Ninja. Yes. Okay, the doctor intimidated the captain. Anything else? Alright. Oh. Yeah. His father is getting sicker. He hasn't died. What are some questions you should be asking? What are some questions you should be asking? I'm not going to say we should try and answer it right now, but you should have some questions. Yeah? I was wondering when the seaman was going to come. The seafaring man with one leg? Yeah. Ah, when is that guy going to show up? All right, good. Other questions we should ask? What's, what's in his like, box upstairs? Yeah, what is in that box that you can't open? Yeah? I was probably going to make a, um, think that, did he steal something from the semen that makes him so scared of them? Ah, did he steal something that makes him scared of them? That's a good question. Yeah? Um, has the narrator tried to open the box or figure out what's in it yet? Okay, has the narrator tried or snuck in to see what's inside the box? Other questions from other people. What are questions you should be asking to see if the author is going to answer? Why is the casting scared for one reason? Why is the captain scared or concerned about the seafaring man with one leg? Yeah? What, what, what did he do before? Like, what was his job? Ah, what was his job? What, because he said, well, you might call me, you might call me Captain. Okay. Captain Crunch? <laughs> captain of what? He does tell stories when he gets drunk about being on the ocean. And he was with a bunch of evil people. Hmm. But we don't get any specifics. Alright, yeah? Uh, did he work with the seafaring man with one leg? Yeah, maybe. Did he work with the seafaring man with one leg? Yeah? Does he have a crew? Uh, does he have a crew? If he was working on the ship with, with people, with, with, does he have a crew? Or is he separate? Yeah? What relationship does he have with the... Yeah, what kind of relationship does he have with the seafaring man with one leg? What about from the first paragraph of the story? Do you need to go back to that to be able to, answer, to ask some questions from that? Go back to the first paragraph of the story. What are some questions that you should be asking? Because remember, the author wants to give you enough to keep you interested. And if you're being a good reader, you won't be surprised by other things later. Sometimes you will be surprised, but you've got to be a good listener. Yeah? Um, why does the doctor want him to write it down? Why does the doctor want him to write it down? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Who is the rest of these gentlemen? Ah, yeah, it says the rest of these gentlemen. Who is that? Yeah? yeah? Who, uh, and who is Squire Trelawney? All right, Squire Trelawney. You'll be able to say it easier in the future. It's a weird word. Who's Squire Trelawney? What's a squire? Okay. What's a squire? Yeah. The guys that help like the night people. Yeah, it's a point, in this point in time, it's somebody who helps. They're part of the military, but they're like a helper of a knight. But I think uh, in this story, he's may, maybe more like a, like a guard or something along those lines. Uh, we'll see, because I don't think they had knights in the 1700s anymore. That was more of a 1400s thing, but that's, it's a noble position to be a squire. 
Um, I guess my question is at this point in time is, what's a little kid, what part is he going to play in the rest of this? Right? Let's talk a little bit about who's Jim Hawkins. Nobody's asked me about Jim Hawkins, all right? That's his name. That's the narrator's name. What are some things we could should, we could do know about Jim Hawkins? How yeah. old is he? How old is he? All right. He's, he's about 13, 12 or 13, all right? Any other? What are some things we do know about him? What's he like right now? Yeah. Well, he lives in a hotel with his father. Okay, he lives in a hotel with his father. Accepting laybacks from the captain. Come again? Oh, he's accepting like <laughs> money from the captain? Mm -hmm. All right, he's kind of yeah. taking money from under the table. Bravery. How about this? Is he a brave kid? Yeah. What? Yes or no? Yes, why is he brave? Why is he brave, Katie? Because he said he wasn't really scared of the, uh, of the captain when everyone else was. Okay, he was, he's not scared of the captain. All right? Does he get the money from the captain for his dad? No. But he is brave enough to go ask for it for himself, right? All right. Uh, is he smart? Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. No. Does he know what this guy is? No. No, he doesn't have a clue what this guy is. All right. Uh, does he seem like a good guy? Yeah. No. Or is he a bad guy? Bad guy. Kind of in the middle. Kind of in the middle. Why in the middle? Because he's not really doing anything. So, okay, so he's, he's more of just a neutral. neutral person right now, right? We don't really know what. He's just kind of somebody who would, we call him a wallflower, where they can sit back and not really be seen. And they don't really, you don't really notice him. He's somebody who we don't really pay attention to. And that's why I wonder, Gabe, why he's telling this story. Somebody who's just kind of in the middle. He's kind of brave. Not the smartest guy. How is he going to be involved in this? And that's why I wanted to make sure I mentioned the idea of a dynamic character. Anybody remember what a dynamic character is? No, what's a dynamic character? It really change throughout the story. Good. It will, it's a character who changes. And what we're going to do over the next few days is we learn the setting and characters is try and break down what is he like and then as we track him, let's see, is he a static character or a dynamic character? All right? Um, okay, any other questions before we take a look at some of the vocab words? Okay, your assignment is to try and read chapters two and three. Now that you have a better idea of our setting and some of the main characters, try and read chapters two and three. There's going to be some questions tomorrow when you come in and over what we read today to make sure that you were tracking. All right? Okay. You too.